Welcome to Unapologetically Bold, I'm Not Sorry For. If you are a person that is tired of apologizing for being you, you know, the human part of you that sometimes feels like it has to be different at home versus work versus play, the human side that just wants to be hot, humble, open, and transparent about your wants, desires, and uniqueness. If you answered yes, this is for you. Join me, Emily Elrod, as I dive into conversations with amazing guests about what they are not sorry for in creative and loving ways. Let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another Unapologetically Bold, I'm Not Sorry For. Today, I'm pumped because I actually have a good friend with me, Rucker, on. Thanks for joining me, Rucker. Absolutely. Thanks for the invite. It is going to be a fun conversation. And for all that is tuning in right now, just want to do that quick little ask. If you will continue to like, subscribe, and share as our goal is to bring a little positivity, not just all rainbows and butterflies, but some reality to your news feed. So let's just go ahead and hop on in. Now, Rucker, I know you, so I'm going to do a little introduction. Um, (laughs) He's like, oh, no. Um, But Rucker, somebody I met at Sanford, we have known each other for, wow, it's going to make us feel old, like, what, 10? Is it almost 10 years? 10 years, yeah. 10-ish years. We've been good buds. We have, um, you've went from Sanford, that's where we met, um, through my best friend, Sarah. She introduced us because y'all went to school together mm-hmm. as well. That's cool, yeah. And then now you are at Davidson College mm-hmm. and you are the head baseball coach and you're also just an awesome dude. Um, and we nerd out a lot about just how the human body works and just how to be better every day. And so I'm excited for you to come on the show and especially to talk about what we're going to speak on today. So anything else to add to that? No, I, I think that's great. I, I think the I think what you're doing here is wonderful. I think this this past year has been, been different for a lot of people in so many ways. And I think the thing that's allowed me to do is branch off in some topics like this. And whether you're a, a baseball coach, a, a husband, a father, a mother, a wife um, or a person that works uh, you know, on a college campus or nothing to do with college or uh, high school athletes or college athletes. Um, this time has been wonderful for so many different people to, to look into different things. So for me, an opportunity like this to speak and, and talk about some of the things that I've learned, I think it's awesome. Uh, but I think, you know, just from, from watching this show with, with, with uh, Andy Bass, with Matt Rice, I've learned from this. So this has been a cool opportunity to me. Um, to learn from those guys, learn from you, and now to be able to be on here is tremendous. But uh, very quick on my background, went, went to high school, uh, Bayside Academy with, with Sarah Sears, and uh, very briefly, maybe a great person you have at some point, their head volleyball coach, Ann Schilling, they just won a national record, I think, it's 17 or 18th straight state title. Um, so an incredible, incredible coach, so literally, you know, literally a national record uh, from a smaller school, and Sarah was part of that. Uh, we went from went from Bayside to Vanderbilt, played there, learned from a you know a coach that probably impacted me as anybody as much as anybody with the exception maybe my father and Tim Corbin and you know, what he's built Vanderbilt baseball into is a really an incredible thing on a lot of different levels, and, and that was a, probably a big big influence in me getting into coaching. And I think I got into it because I, I love the game of baseball, and the more I've done it, uh, it's, it's people, it's hopefully helping the, the college age person develop in, in such a, a special time in their life. And that kind of kind of brings us here where. You know, this year I've tried to learn as much as I can. It's been a year there's been a lot thrown at us on a lot of different levels. And I'm just really thankful that people such as yourself and a lot of the guests you've had on are, are trying to help people through this time, help people better others, which I think is a, a wonderful and much needed thing. Well, thank you so much. And I think it's too that I hope the audience can get your heart out of this because I think what we're going to be talking about, what you're not sorry for, sometimes can be co- come off as like, you may not care about some people at times where I know your heart and I know your passion and love for people. So I think let's just go ahead and dive into it. It's called unapologetically bold. What are you not sorry for? I am, I am not sorry for loving my career. I love it. And and that's the thing too, is that you're in baseball. So Mm -hmm. I call that a lifestyle yeah. And it is something that you are going to miss weddings. You're going to miss births. You're going to mm-hmm. miss a lot of things that some people in their minds see you being selfish. But I see it as a sacrifice because 
I could only imagine you not doing baseball that you might be like a grumpy old man. Yeah, yeah. So, so say yeah, even when I'm doing it. Uh, but, you know, I, I think you hit on the head. I think it's it, it's a lifestyle. And I think there's there's some people I think that celebrate that. I think there's some people that you know, man, it should be a lifestyle. It, it's not it's not who you are. It's just, just what you do. And I, I think I, at different points in, in my life, I've gone back and forth on that. But the more I've done it. As I kind of alluded to there a few minutes ago, I think if you just look at the wins and losses, if you just look at, you know, we've got to recruit this player because he's a good player. Uh, if you just look at, hey, we've got to get cool uniforms or we've got to go play in this tournament, I think that maybe devalues what it is, uh, at mm -hmm. least in my opinion. And I was talking with the travel coach a little bit earlier, and uh, a lot of programs now, they recruit guys, and they cut guys, those guys don't develop. And, and where I'm at, where I've been, never really been a program that's done that and not saying we're right and others are wrong. I think the collegiate athletics are certainly evolving to a very, very uh, lucrative field in a lot of different areas, especially men's basketball and football. Uh, but for me, for where I've been, where I've been at, um, I think it's a lot about the human element. It's developing that 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 year old. You know, as we all know, that's a very, very uh, unique time in our lives. I think if you have you know good mentorship, good guidance, and not staying on that, by any stretch of imagination, but I've certainly had that in my life. And I think you would kind of want to repay that. And for me, it's not, I'm not trying to create my experience at Vanderbilt for anyone, but I'm trying to create a, a unique experience for those guys while they're here. And whether they like me every practice or even every month or every season, not really as big of a deal to me as when they look back, you know, five, 10, 20 years. They hope to find a lot of impact for, from the program and being around myself and the other coaches. So, yeah, I definitely think it's a lifestyle. And you're right. You're going to miss uh, missed a couple of my best friends from, from college's weddings. Um, miss, you know, maybe some family members you're not as close as you want to see often. And certainly some friends. Uh, that, that's part of it. And I don't think at this point in life I really regret any of that. And I think that's a, a special thing to be able to look back and be really content with, with where you're at uh, in life at this point. And I think that's important, too, because some people miss things as crutches sometimes yeah. or they use their work as a crutch. Yeah. But there's also a confidence in whenever, you know, you're walking out your purpose in life, because I, I know you, like I said, I, I've, I've known you for years. Mm -hmm. I feel like God put you on this earth for you to do the work that you're doing, mm -hmm. because I know your passion, your care. And I know the side conversations that we had have had about just the people and how you want to help them be better. Mm -hmm. And. Talk about for a minute why that it why you perceive that's different whenever you, you walk out in a career and 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 moreover even a calling comparative just a job. Yeah, so I, I think you can go several ways with that. I think one that maybe jumps out that's a little bit, you know, maybe that's not as, as agree with as much is sometimes I think as, as individuals, you know, they're, they're we definitely conform to what society expects. Um, you know, especially heck, being from the South, which I, I'm from about as far South Alabama as you can be. Um, yeah, I think there, there are things that are very traditional. Um, I think that, you know, you're supposed to maybe sometimes work that nine to five or, or maybe 15, 20 years ago, you're supposed to follow in your, your, your parents' footsteps and, and have their business, which I think something is as you've talked about on here before. Um, so for me, I think it's sometimes if I'm doing something that maybe my peers or my friends weren't, um, there's that feeling maybe being the, you know, the, the black sheep and being different. Mm -hmm. I think by, you know, by playing in college, I wasn't good enough to play professionally, but a lot of my teammates were, and, and we've got a very close group of about 10, 12, 15 guys. And a lot of us are in baseball and a lot of guys are professional baseball. Uh, one or two are still playing, uh, but a lot of guys are professional coaches or they're in the front office and administrative roles. Uh, for me, there's a couple other guys that are coaching in college, a couple guys are coaching professionally. And I think we're really proud of each other. And you know, as you kind of look back on it, I think there's certainly something there where we push each other a little bit, I think in a good, healthy way. Uh, I think we want each other to do well and to succeed. I think there's some pride with each other. So you know, as I've thought about it for me, I think I've been really fortunate in that my peer group is kind of trended that way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I don't go to Vanderbilt, then, then maybe I'm not doing what I'm doing. Uh, I think I'd still be trying to help people. Uh, my mom's a teacher, dad's a, was a CPA. And in their own ways, they're both very involved with, with helping with helping others. So maybe not quite this role, but I, I think still think at the end of the day, would want to be interacting with people. And 
you know, I say as a guy, I kind of considers myself an introvert, <laughs> um, but, but I still do like you know, the idea of, of being a positive influence. Even it's just a, a small, a small influence at that. So maybe a long answer to your question. I think I was just fortunate where I was in a group that, that was okay. Had I not been in this group, there might, I might have gone with that peer pressure of maybe you don't go to that college. Maybe you don't play that sport. And things are probably a little bit different right now is the reality. And I think it's important to note the sphere of influence and the people that you surround yourself with and that going for those people that push you, that strive you to be better daily. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have a very personal connection, especially your father. You you Mm -hmm. have an adoration for your father and how he has helped you a lot in the work that you, you do and your love for baseball and then continuing that on. So it's a two part question is one in your sphere of influence and the people that have built you up and mentored you. When did you realize that it's okay to do what you you have always loved to do? And then the other aspect of it is how do you think that has affected you and your success? Because you're actually very successful in the work that you do and you've been successful. Do you think that has had an impact on you following what you love early? and having those people to promote it? Yeah, those, those are good questions. So um, I did go to Vanderbilt, but I'm definitely not a math major. So if you if I lose track of keeping up with both questions, um, help, help remind me here. Um, but, but I think to the first point, you know, I think the, you know, not just my dad, but, you know, my best friend um, growing up, uh, his dad was also our youth baseball coach. So mm-hmm. you've got two really positive models um, two people that you like, and typically spend a lot of time with outside the baseball field. Uh, you know, we would watch other sporting events. We would go to Auburn football games. So you have two really good role models right there. Uh, there's a guy that I referred to as an uncle uh, that also, you know, not a biological uncle, but a guy that was, was close to the family that was heavily involved uh, in the youth baseball programs that we were part of. So I think just having the, the mentors, the positive influence, a lot of my, my friends that were older played sports and, and, you know, whether right or wrong, I gravitated toward those people because they were good athletes. Um, so I think just a lot of early influences on me as I got older. Uh, my high school coach was a very positive influence, um, you know, in not just baseball, but a couple other sports. Then when I got to college, you know, it's a, it's a heck of a coaching group. Looking back, my college coach is still at Vanderbilt. They won you know, multiple national championships now. Coach for Team USA, and he's you know widely regarded as one of the best, if not the uh, best, college baseball coach right now. One of his assistants is now the head coach at uh, University of Michigan, who just was the national runner-up. Uh, very well-respected coach. The pitching coach, who I was really close with, uh, has been a, a major league pitching coach now with two different organizations. Currently with the Reds. Um, one of the assistant coaches now the head coach of East Carolina. He's got an incredible reputation. Another guy is a professional coach, and a couple of other guys are, are friends that are. Um, division three and division two coaches. So just being around a lot of really good people that, that were um, also really good at their jobs that were highly motivated to, to turn that program around and they invested in us as people. So, mm-hmm. you know, from that side of it, I, I, and obviously it had been hard to not do something like this, but there's definitely a lot of really positive mentorships and influence and guidance um, not always the lovey-dovey, hey, you're the best. A lot of people are tough love, especially later on in the process. But I think there's a lot of value in, you know, honest assessment, clear assessment. And I struggle with that. And not to delve too far off topic here, but man, my, my freshman year, I played a lot as a freshman, thought I was great. A lot of my self-value was tied into being, uh, you know, starting in the SEC as a freshman. And then about midway through the year came, and I realized that the SEC was a lot better than I was, and I struggled. I pouted. Um, I, I didn't really know how to respond, and it was tough. There was a, a really tough period there for about six months and had great guidance from my dad, my mom, and, and my high school coach at the time and some others. But, you know, the college coaches, it was tough, and I had to either get better or get gone, and I got a little bit better, better enough to stick around. But that probably made me want to succeed um, even more to, to some level, be it as a player, as a coach. So – a long answer to your first question, I think it's just really good mentorship that, that kind of pushed me in that direction. And probably, I probably realized it was okay um, really early on in the process. I, my father and really both of my parents always said, you know, do something you love, 
and you know try to be your own boss. And I still I've got oversights. We got athletic administration here and, and presidents and board of trustees, and, and they're all very supportive of the the student athlete experience here at Davidson. Uh, but you know, being the head coach, uh, there, there's a lot of influence you get to have on your program. We try to give our players a lot of of say. Try to give the other coaches a lot of say, and I think that's something that I value the input of all those guys. You know, at the end of the day, it's still going to be my decision and things. But I think I've found something that I really enjoy. And even if it's not traditional, even if there's not many nine to fives, um, the weekends aren't aren't days off. Um, far from it. The summer, a lot of people are like, oh, what do you do in the summer? You go, you go to the beach or and like, no, we recruit. like, oh, okay, so you run camps. Like, no, the summer is actually busier than the spring and the fall. So um, that, there's definitely some times you made you question it early on with, hey, is this the right thing? You know, if I lose this relationship, is this the right thing? Or, you know, I've got a college degree and I started out as a volunteer assistant at Sanford and um, you're not getting paid a whole lot in, in those roles. That, that's part of it. And that probably, that probably was the biggest thing for me was how much um, I enjoyed it, even though some of the, the uh, basic needs of food, shelter, all that good stuff were not, uh, not super straightforward at that time. And, uh, oh, that's so true, though. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that's important, too. I'll say from my perspective, a lot of the work that I've done is I and I don't even know if you know this, that I took a secretary job with a master's degree just so I could work my way up to be where I wanted to in the wellness industry and right. then started my own business. But the thing is, is if you have if you can set yourself up to sometimes, yeah, money is needed and you ha you may have to do multiple jobs. But if you can start doing that thing that you love every day, you, my father's always told me that if you love what you do every day, you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. And I think a big part of that too, is whenever you love your career, it's not that it's not stressful and it's not that you're going to have sucky times and it's not mm -hmm. that it's going to be the easy cakewalk, but you can adapt and overcome a little bit better. So I'd love to talk about that a bit because you're in baseball. It is, mm -hmm a game of wins and losses and sometimes mm -hmm. there's more losses than there are wins mm -hmm. but for you you've had a lot of winning records mm -hmm. so how do you think your love of your uh, for what you do translates on the field for your players I mean, you hope they see it um i think you know in college and in high school i was around a lot of guys that you could see it. Uh, I've been able to work for, you know, as an assistant coach, two different head coaches with very different personalities, um, but both really good people that w treated me well. And I think I've been really fortunate in my baseball career and really in life uh, to be around people that are good people. I have a lot of guys that were my age that maybe started off in college coaching that because of the, the lack of income, maybe starting out, or they work for a really tough boss that maybe didn't care about them as people as much um, that aren't doing it now. So I, I've been really fortunate. Uh, I had maybe some opportunities for jobs that paid a little bit more early on that after a lot of thought and prayer and um, probably too much thought that, um, you know, I chose not to do it. Some people thought, man, you're, you're, what are you doing? You should go there. And, you know, looking back, it was the right decision. So I, I was really fortunate to get good, good counsel, uh, and clear guidance in those. Um, with the players seeing it, especially a, a college educated, a smart guy, um, they're going to know if you're being genuine or not. And they're going to know if you're prepared for the day. They're going to know, most of them are going to know if you truly care or not. Some guys, well, he yelled at me or I'm not starting. He doesn't care. And, and I, don't, I don't think that's the case with most of the guys. Certainly does exist at some level. Um, we try to be really transparent with them. Uh, mm -hmm. We try to, to give them an idea of where they stand, where we're going, how they fit into it. And is it perfect communication? No, absolutely not. That's something that I really try to use this last nine months to get better at. Um, but I think if the guys, they're going to see it. And mm -hmm. there, there are some coaches that maybe are up and down. Um, I think for me, consistency, the same demeanor is incredibly important you know, for a coach, but also for the players, you know, I think the, the guys that, you know, what you're getting day in and day out, the, as coaches, you kind of gravitate towards them. You tend to have more trust with them on the field and, you know, there's a comfort level there. So for us, we realize that they're, they're, they're 18, 19, 20, there's going to be this, you know, <laughs> not, you know, they're aliens. 
uh, for us and really the last like two and a half years now, I probably try to, I probably do more thinking about off the field things with them, the, the team, the team development, the individual development from the person that then is as the player. And that's been something that as much as I love the X's and O's, the end game strategy, I think that's been a really been a bigger focus. And, and that, again, to me, that plays into the bigger picture of the human being, the type of person. And, and we talked this year, you know, given the weirdness of this year, you know, there's going to be a handful of games we play some teams this year that are flat out better players than us. Um, there's may, might be a couple that we might have a little bit more talented players, but you know, the game of baseball, there's going to be a lot of similarities in our talent level this year. And um, we had, had the opportunity to listen to a guy that's with the Kansas City Chiefs now, and he talked about, they talked their guys, Kansas City Chiefs, you know, Super Bowl champions last year. The scoreboard's on. You know, people say 2020 this, 2020. Okay, well, at Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City, that scoreboard works. Um, you know, Bryant Denny Stadium, Tuscaloosa, um, Alabama football, that scoreboard works. And, you know, we talked with our guys, we're going to, you know, we're going to play. A South Carolina, we're going to play a Duke, a Wake Forest. Um, they're going to have really nice big scoreboards, and it's going to be turned on. Uh, we have a, a five-year-old scoreboard here that's that's nice, and it works. And there's going to be a you know, winner and loser each game. And, and for us, I think it's been really getting the guys to focus on it's okay to have ups and downs, but at the end of the day, when you're between those lines, it's about competing for that common goal. And, yeah, we're absolutely not going to win every game this year. And as a coach, I can handle that. I, I really can. I think for us, if the focus is there, if the effort is there, uh, we can handle the rest of it. You know, I'm talking about. I'm going to make mistakes with, with strategy in game. That's part of it. Um, I can live with you guys making physical mistakes. That is going to happen. Our job is trying to get those guys to the best place mentally they can be. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're just playing. And as you well know, whew, especially with a 20 year old athlete, there's so many things that go into that, and, and much less in this year. So that's been really kind of a cool, I don't want to call it a struggle or a battle, but it's been really kind of a cool learning thing for us. We talk about it a lot. We try to get input from different guys on things. And, um, you know, if we can get in the, if we can be the, the best team we can be mentally, you know, the physical part things to take care of itself this year in pretty good place. So, um, again, kind of a, a longer answer to your question, but I think if the guys see you care about them, if they can see your mm -hmm. passion about what you're doing, that's whether that's players, your coworkers, your management, uh, I think it shines through. I think that's the beauty. Uh, there's so many things about technology I don't love, but if you're if you're a hard if you're a hard worker, um, people can find you. You know, much like mm -hmm. if you're if you're a really talented athlete and you're in Montana, well, with the beauty of social media with, with video, you know, college recruiters can find you. I think if you're a really talented writer, there's ways to, to get published that the world can see it. You know, online that maybe even 20 years ago didn't exist. You, you can get your story out there uh, for good and bad. Um, you know, so for us, I, th I think it just ties back to we're as a coach, I think we're passionate about what we do and we're fairly meticulous in the recruiting process. We have a lot of guys that want to be at Davidson uh, for the academics, for the school side. And that's incredibly important. And I learned that by watching some programs at other places that maybe didn't have the, the right fits or people that weren't there for the right reason. And there's a lot of transfers, a lot of guys leaving, mm -hmm. guys, girls, playing on sport. And for us, we want people that want to be here. We also want them to be really successful at baseball. We're not going to use academics as a crutch or why we can't win a baseball game. And it's a challenge. And it's not for everyone. And that's fine. Uh, you know, if a guy who recruits somebody said, Coach, y'all y'all are you know, a national profile enough for baseball for me, that's fine. Uh, if a guy says, Coach, I, I can't handle the academic load, I'd much rather know that as a junior in high school than as a, as a sophomore in college. So I think it's a lot that goes into it. And you talk about, you know, getting the right people on the bus and we'll figure out where we're going and, and some of those good good uh, analogies or thought processes. Mm -hmm. you know, I think we certainly buy into that to some level. And I think that's really important too, just to note that if people can't see your love and your passion for this, I think that they have to be deaf or blind because I, I think it's just, like I said, I know your heart. And that was my goal for this too, especially having you on is having people like you that care for the players. And we've even joked like this too, because we were talking back and forth about what the title of this would be. Mm -hmm. And one of them we had, we had touched on was a possibility of talking about how you're not sorry for caring for your people or for your students uh, or your athletes as stu people mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. And because, but I think that shows, and I think that's so important, but understanding 
that especially where you're at, it's a high performance, high perfection environment yeah. at times where, you know, we've talked about this. We want to go from the model of a progression over perfection, but like right. all the work for these years that you have these people and you've just cared and you've poured out. And I think that's important for what you're not sorry is if you never loved your career, you couldn't deal with it because there's a lot of junk. Cause we've also talked about that offline on whenever you come in the coaching thing, there are things that happen in life. <laughs> you're like, yeah. Ooh, I didn't know. I thought I was just doing skills. And yeah. then there's other things that pop up. Yeah. So um, for people that are apologizing for loving their career, what would you tell them? Cool. Um, you know, the easy cop out answers, every situation is different. Uh, but I think for me, and, and when things have come up, be it career things within the career, things with work-life balance. I think that, you know, one, I've always had a good support system. Um, my wife is Scottish, so baseball is not something that um, she knew a whole heck of a lot about now. And, and she uh, she doesn't maybe understand the nuances of a double switch, but, you know, she knows what a home run is and, you know, strike out and good stuff. So I think she's been great to, to have that support. I think the the administration, our former coach, uh, head coach Dick Cook, is, is our sport oversight. And he's been a, a great sounding board. You know, the, our assistant coaches, Ryan Munger, Parker Baines, Aaron Lisak, and, and Dylan Elbert, they all are really invested in kind of the same concept, not just, you know, the baseball side, but they care about the kids. And mm -hmm. I think if you've got a lot of people, you know, rowing the boat in the same direction, you're going to have some good things there. So for me, you know, in a broad sense, if, you know, whatever your basis for decision making is, um, follow that. And, and for me, it's, I'm, I'm a, a believer first and foremost. So at the end of the day, you know, I, I'm going to follow what I think, you know, the Lord wants me to do. And if the world, if, you know, guys on the team, other coaches have disagreed with that, but I feel like that's right with him. I'll figure it out at some point. I, I'm not too worried about it. So for me, whatever your 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 north star is, your your rock, your foundation, at the end of the day, for me, you got to go with that. Um, secondly, I think that you know you have to make sure you're doing something you love, and whether that's your recreational activity, whether that's um, you know your job, I think you've got to be truly invested into it and you think you have to be okay with hey this is a priority it's a priority um I, this is a, a i think i mentioned to you the cool book i read a year or two ago and i actually went back and reread it about six months ago but atomic habits they they're and i'm gonna botch it because i'm not that smart but there's a it's an example whether it's true or not it, it stuck with me and guy walks up on on a couple um, two guys outside of a restaurant and, you know, the guy walks up and goes, Hey, do you guys have a light? And the first guy goes, uh, man, I, I'm trying to quit, but you know, here's, here's my cigarette lighter. And the second guy goes, I'm glad he does. Cause I'm not, a, I, I don't smoke cigarettes. Now both men were actually trying to quit, but the first one said, Hey, I, I, I'm trying to quit. The second guy says, I'm not a cigarette smoker. So for me, that really shows you know, how do we self-identify? Mm -hmm. um, and, and for a lot of my thought, going, why, if I'm a baseball coach, and I've got no issue with saying that, uh, a lot of my decisions are made through that lens. So if you're a stay-at-home mom, and some people might turn up your nose that, but that's what you want to do, and your family's good with it, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, it's, if you're a stay-at-home dad, you know, which society might go, oh, well, yeah, that's different. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, if you work a, a part time job, but you love it and you've got other priorities and your support system, people that rely on you are good with it, man, rock it, you know, go with it. So, you know, I don't know. If that's even really good advice. But for me, it's what's your what's your guiding light? What's your foundation? What's your North Star? And then are the people around you the right people? And if not, mm -hmm. you know, maybe like the old spring cleaning, maybe you got to cut people out or reposition them you know, within your closet and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, as the old, mm -hmm. the old cliche is life's too short. And man, you hit on, you hit on the, your spirits of influence earlier, the people you surround yourself with. If you've got, you know, there's some show that, that my wife watches, it's real housewives or home records of something. <laughs> and, and I'm sure they're great people maybe, but if I, you know, if I was one of the cast members on that show, I couldn't handle the drama, not for me, not how I operate. 
But if you want to run that circle, that's how you function better, go do it. But for me, if I had some of those people, you know, we're, we're on the chopping block. And, 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 that's, and that's just me. I might be you know, a little, little simpleton on that, but that's how I would operate. No, and I think it's so true because, like I said, like we've talked throughout this, your sphere of influence matters. And I think that's so important. I think this actually pulls up a good comment that James put out. It says, if you or Mike, if you live your life with love, you will love the life you live. And that's the thing. And not only just the people, but also the things that you are doing. So I am so grateful for you to join me today, Rucker. So if anybody does, they hear this and they're like, hey, I may want to reach out to him. And by the way, you have a Wikipedia page. I didn't even know that. Uh, just FYI. Sure, okay. um, <laughs> so don't get him on Wikipedia because I bet you I know how he is with technology. He yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so but if people do want to reach out or may just want to have a discussion, maybe deeper, how could they how could they find you? Yeah, so it's just not a ton of tech. Uh, I do have uh, Twitter. And I think it's just at Rucker Taylor. You know, I'm the fourth named after my great grandfather, but um, my grandfather, my great grandfather, not living, and my dad is is less uh, tech savvy than I am. So uh, Rucker Taylor on Twitter, and then my email is R U. So the first two first two letters of Rucker R U Taylor at Davidson.edu. Um, yeah, we we'll, would we'll love to. You know, sports, non sport related, we'll love to talk and. You know, as I said earlier, I've learned so much from from you know shows like this. Uh, Andy and Matt in particular, obviously, have a, a sports slant on it. Have been wonderful, and as you and I talk about, I think Andy's um, one. I've sent his information to a couple of people today, and I think what he's doing is tremendous. And um, you know, if anybody's got any kind of, of of story for me that might help on the baseball side or personally, or if I can listen or you know give any kind of thoughts, we would be more than happy to. And you know, all of our, our athletes went home at Thanksgiving. We, we've got eight weeks uh, without them, and the honey to do list is only so long. So I'm, I've got some time. Um, so so would love to chat with whoever. Uh, that would be awesome. But yeah, so Twitter's uh, at Rucker Taylor, and email is uh, rutaylor at davidson.edu. Uh, I think my dad has LinkedIn. I think you chastised me for not having it. So yeah, I have just a few times. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, We're eventually going to get you on there. It's yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so dad's awesome. He'd love to talk with you too, but it's, <laughs> it's a, little bit different, a little bit different conversation maybe. Oh, well, I appreciate you so much. And I thank you for all that tuned in. Have an amazing and